welcome to episode 414 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with Jessica Carr, Grace Winburn, and Andrew Swafford. Uh, in today's episode, we're going to be talking about movies that we saw this week in part one, which is actually just going to be one movie this week because we're jumping in discourse. <laughs> um, and then in part two, we're going to be continuing our Young Critics Watch Old Movie series with 1965's Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, which I'll say with that inflection every time. I think you should say it while pronouncing the punctuation. Faster comma pussycat exclamation point kill exclamation point kill exclamation point. I kind of wanted to say it in like an... <laughs> I wanted to say it like an old British man. I just kind of be like, faster, pussycat, kill, kill. <laughs> like I was like a bad James Bond impersonator. Which sounds like a James Bond title to be, if we're being honest. It does, yeah. I could see it as an Austin Powers. Yeah, the Austin Powers riff on Octopussy or something, yeah. That'd be good too. Yeah. I was thinking of Austin. We'll talk about that in part two. I was thinking about Austin Powers, though, when they were like karate chopping. It reminded me of Michael Caine going, judo chop. <laughs> anyway, that's a whole other thing. That's for part two. That's part two nonsense. Um, in part one, let's talk a little bit about the movie sweeping, sweeping the nation. The old, the old discourse starter, and that is uh, "Nope" by uh, Jordan Peele. Is there a discourse about this movie? I mean, I know that there's discourse are, about have everything. Opinions, but uh, as someone who's not on Twitter anymore, I don't uh, know how. I'm just saying discourse to just kind of just get this along. Really, <laughs> I'm just I'm just moving this thing along, man. It's it's a train, um, but uh, so Nope is about follows uh, Daniel Kaluuya and Kiki Palmer's characters who are horse trainers for Hollywood. They live in this love the, love this word a gulch in uh, in California. They live in a gulch, um, and while they're while they're living there, there's a there's a unidentified flying object that they see over their house, and so they try to get more and more information and figure out why it's there as uh, as the days go along um this also stars steven yun keith keith david's in it for like three minutes which is a crime to be honest um and uh david wincott but uh yeah i think everybody here has seen it who uh who wants to jump in the water and uh talk about nope first or jump on the horse and talk about nope well, first we should, i think we should preface for our listeners that we are an even split on this movie we have two negative uh voices and two positive voices so i maybe we should first hear the case for the movie um yeah why grace or no no i think i think we should do you negative, do negative first, first because all right hell yeah, yeah that's how because i, like to go. I feel like we're gonna be defending it for the whole rest of that time. Well, I wanted so to I give you like your time. I need like, to have the floor, you know? Nah, I need to be locked and loaded <laughs> so I have time to think about what what the problem is. Should, should we do it? What the problem is, Should we is, do bro? it that way? Yeah. <laughs> There's a visual joke. There's a visual joke let's, happening here for uh, podcast let's listeners. A, let's pull our audience uh, right now. <laughs> okay, we can start negative. We can start negative. Yeah, let's go for I it. Will, hey, I will you. open the discourse here. Uh, as the Now the, there's discourse. Yeah, someone who is like blissfully unaware of the actual discourse. Uh, here's my interjection to it. Um, so my take on the Jordan Peele oeuvre as it exists right now, is Get Out, I think, is an amazing movie. I underrated it when I reviewed it on Cinematary back in the day. Um, So maybe I will say the same thing about Nope later on. I don't know. Um, Us, I mostly enjoyed, but felt like it did not even come close to the same level, um, mostly because of the way that Jordan Peele um, decided to just play in ambiguity in that movie. He, he did the whole marketing thing where he, he like marketed it as like the Rorschach ink blot. Um, you know, the movie means whatever you see in it. And I think that's just kind of like a dumb goal to pursue personally. Um, yeah. And with Nope, I was kind of expecting a little bit more of that. I was expecting, I was going in somewhat pessimistic. You know, this is, the, the trailer doesn't look that good. Um, I'm expecting this to be along the same lines of us, where it's a little bit messy, um, not, not nearly as, like, pointed and um, thoughtful as Get Out, right? Um, and I did get that. I, that is mostly how I feel about it, but the the bigger, more overriding feeling that I was really surprised by is I was not expecting to be bored. 
I did not. I, I thought that it was very possible that Jordan Peele could make a messy movie. I did not think it was humanly possible for Jordan Peele to make a boring movie. Um, and like, I just think this whole thing feels a little dull. I think that these characters are not particularly interesting. I don't think they're given interesting lines. I don't think the performances are particularly evocative, though I do think Kinky Palmer is a great performer in general. I just don't think her character is given much to do here. Um, and I thought that like the actual like visuals of it, the the setting that we're in and kind of like the dynamics of the images just felt very flat to me. Like I'm seeing a lot of things on Letterboxd about how like, you know, the spectacle is amazing and like every single shot feels like it matters and every image feels like a thing that Jordan Peele has like been mulling over for 10 years or whatever. But I like never felt like any of the individual images were all that inspired, really. Um, it just felt like he was getting coverage uh, for the this kind of uninteresting set that's just like a flat plane basically um, yeah it's it, he had um it, he has hoyt van hoytema who's done a lot of the recent uh christopher nolan movies he uh he did like tinker taylor soldier spy very acclaimed um yeah he's a great cinematographer, uh, cinematographer. great cinematographer he just i don't feel like he gets that much to shoot here i don't know no um, it's very it's very expansive i was thinking about how um I was thinking about it in comparison to some like kind of more classic westerny movies or even something like Night of the Hunter which utilizes space in a, like a sinister way and I felt like that would have been better suited than like Hoyt Van Hoytema going like yeah, bah! it just all feels and you know it's a flat land but it does feel all very flat and empty um, and like I also I thought, thought that the way the plot kind of like unfolded felt a little flat and empty to me too like the movie just it's his longest movie by a lot it's like over two two hours and ten minutes or something it takes like 40 minutes to like show its hand and explain what it's even about and then once it explains what it's about you're kind of just seeing variations on the same scene on a loop for the rest of the movie um, like these people were running around trying to take a picture of this thing. Did they get the picture up? Oh, nope. Maybe they'll get it next time. You know, like I was just getting, I'm have, experiencing that scene over and over and over. Um, and like, if I sit and mull it over, like, I think there are thoughtful things going on in this movie about like, it's kind of a meta. It feels to me like kind of a meta textual thing about cinema you know, you have um, this UFO creature that looks like a giant eye. You have these characters who are, um, they trace their roots back to the earliest days of Hollywood. Um, there's um, one character, Steven Yoon's character, refers to the aliens, quote unquote, as the viewers. Um, and then there's like, uh, these are all people who kind of like work in the the sidelines of Hollywood and, and um, they're, they're kind of getting to be heroes here and they have to like employ the help of a cinematographer to help them save the day yada 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 like it's very movie about movies but a i don't feel like those things come together and congeal into anything particularly like firm or interesting and b um i wasn't really thinking about those things or enjoying like what was actually happening on screen while i was watching it so I was just like real I left really deflated and disappointed because like I love Jordan Peele in all of his various projects and like even not liking us a whole lot it was still like a very viscerally like thrilling movie and I just didn't get that from nope that's that's my opening statement Yeah are you gonna, you gonna defend a, it that's now? That's insane. That is so <laughs> crazy. It's so crazy that you watched that and you didn't like feel excited about what was going on that's just insane are i feel you, like people are, are watching you, different like, movies i don't understand <laughs> yeah like are you are you personally like scared of aliens in any way so like the idea um, of being sucked into like base, hey i just you just yeah, watched event like, horizon with me last weekend jessica you know that i i was spooked i mean uh, by an alien movie <laughs> yeah, but that's that's hell in space. That's a little bit different. Uh, this is like, I mean, and even in the movie, they explain like the different types of aliens. Like it could be us from the future or it could be these like things that are trying to like to probe us and like 
I don't know the 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 mechanics of the I don't want to I don't want to spoil anything. This is the non spoiler part, I guess. But the mechanics of like what the thing is doing and like sucking them into and how we're given the viewpoint of a person who is like being sucked into that that is terrifying to me like I'm claustrophobic but also like it's like that that specific scene where all of the people at the amusement park are like sucked into that is a horrifying idea to me like first of all crowds like I hate crowds giant groups of people all together that's already scary but then imagine like all of you being cr like sucked into the air and being crammed into essentially like a digestive system like all together and like not being able to breathe and only hearing people screaming mm -hmm. I think that's and, like, scary I to thought... think about but and it looked kind of weird on screen but it, I wasn't scared watching it happen like it didn't I didn't yeah, feel like, like the movie looked... works to create oh, a scare yeah it looked good on screen is like I think such an understatement like the sound design and like the way the way that we're viewing like this thing that is sucking people into the air like I don't understand how you don't think that that was like crafted like beautifully and done well like it's I don't know I mean like, I'm not gonna say it's not done well like it doesn't look good because it does look good right but I think the the affect of it matters a lot. And again, this is subjective. This is like people watching different movies. Your mileage may vary on like, you know, how scared you are by the concept while the thing is happening. But the only time the movie actually scared me was a fake out scare. It was the, uh, there's a moment where like you think aliens have actually shown up. And I thought that was really scary. <laughs> I, yeah. I love that. <laughs> it was so good. That felt like, <clears throat> that was such a good little like jump scare. I was like, Oh, yeah. I was like, yeah. and then when he and then the movie out, goes like, that questions. feels like Peel. One thing that I really like about like his approach and like, it's also like in the naming of like these movies is it's like our visceral gut reaction. Nope. Like there are some people that have that fight or flight and we're going to talk about fighting and flighting a lot <laughs> in the second half. <laughs> and then, you know, get out. It's a horror movie set in a haunted house. Like, you're yelling at the screen, like, get out of there. Like, I think that this still, like, had some trademarks of him. But I can agree that it, like, definitely wasn't, it wasn't very scary. But I also don't think that, like, a lot of alien movies that I've seen have ever been very scary. Mm -hmm. Like... I, I you're trying more to be a sci-fi thing than a horror. Yes. And then yeah. you were saying, like, how this is a movie, like, you know, it's a movie about movies and, like, what are two more recognizable genres than like a Western and an alien movie? Like, mm. I think that that is, uh, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I, this is a Western alien movie and like everything about it, like Cowboys vs. Aliens. like a really nice. Cowboys movie. vs. Aliens. Are we not <laughs> yeah. Like Cowboys it's versus such aliens. a good, it's always <laughs> so good to see. I, it like, those are, those mesh so well for me. So I had a lot of fun. I, you know, I'm, that's still like my number one takeaway is like, how fun. That was wonderful. Like, I really enjoyed myself. Great time at the picture show. Like, I, the discourse on Twitter is that it was slow. Like you said, like the pacing wasn't there, or, you know, mm -hmm. boring. Like, <clears throat> but I didn't think it was boring at all. But the discourse is that it's slow paced and uh, people weren't getting it. They didn't understand. They said that they had to think more around it. And it's... <laughs> fun right no it's fun like listening wow. to us and it was like having all of this like extra and like very like layered and nuanced conversation when meanwhile other people are like i didn't even understand it i had to think about it like mm -hmm. i think that jordan peele makes movies that demand you to think about them right like um get out as a movie that like kind of invites you to immediately watch it again and like notice every single detail that's kind of seeding where it eventually goes. Um, and like one one criticism I saw in Letterbox was that like this movie feels like it is designed for like a YouTube explainer video or something. Um, and I didn't really get that out of it. It didn't feel like it was trying to be like a puzzle box movie or anything to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I could picture someone doing a little like now the whole thing is like TikTok explainer videos. I see those on my yeah for you all the time and I scroll so fast because they're just going to rot my brain but it would be someone pointing to Steven Yeun's red uh, like nudie suit during the Starlight Lasso experience 
you can see the saucer on his the back. Alien, the alien. Oh, yeah. And then, like, yeah. there were the skulls around, like, the flowers that, like, looked like the little, like, big eyes and, like, round face aliens, like, all throughout. Like, I did not see that. Did you notice that? So, oh, hey, well, he, he, I mean, he. That. Yeah, yeah, he, he designed, designed, he he designed, designed the jacket because that's, that's, I mean, he, he was, was making, making money, money, off money off of that. Off of that. Like, like, he, he was, was trying to be like a cult leader, leader or something. Yeah, yeah like, yeah. He, also, also, they, they had, like, the, the alien masks, masks and shit, shit that they were selling at the amusement park. Now, can you guys explain to me, like, is there more to get about the, um... The, the kids in the alien masks that Steven Yoon's got working for him? Like, that seemed like such a one-off thing. That's Those are kids. his kids. Yeah. Like, Dumb kids. Okay. <laughs> it just felt like such a weird left turn for the movie to take for a second. World, yeah. unite under yeah, alien like, suits. Yeah, like, I thought, I thought that the whole point of the movie was... Like, people trying to make money off of spectacle. So, like, things that are tragic events that are happening and, like, trying to trying to make money off of that. And, like, the very, the very obvious, like, thing was the TMZ guy because it's, like, literally his helmet was a mirror and he had one eye hole that was looking and, like, recording all the time and, like... It is, it reminds me of just kind of, like, how, how now, like, when, when tragic events happen, like, when there's a shooting or when, like, just anything like that happens, we have footage of it now. Like, there are always cameras everywhere watching things, body cam footage, and these are all things that we have at our fingertips. Like, we could watch them at any minute, and there are people who sit around and watch, like, the 9-11 videos over and over and over again, and they're feeding off of this tragedy, and there are people that are making money off of this. And, like, I, I think that it is on purpose that a lot of the people who meet their demise in the movie are people that are specifically trying to exploit, like, other people to make money off of the aliens. And, like... Steven Yun and all of them get sucked up and have like maybe one of the worst deaths because they're trying to he's trying to capitalize on it. And if there if there was one criticism that I had with the movie is that I think that there are lots of there are lots of pieces in it that kind of don't connect and don't make sense, which he he tends to do that in his movies where I think he knows that there are going to be, like, people watching it who are like, well, I saw this, and I caught this, and I wanted to put this together. And, like, the the animal the animal thing just, like, didn't fully connect. Like, the, the title cards with the, uh, with the animals' names, and it's like, they're talking, they're talking about the, the, UFO like it is like it is a predator like it is a creature and so we're the title cards are supposed to be each section of the animal and like either it like reaching its demise or like it preying on something and so I was like so I thought this was weird for a, a couple of reasons like one the the chapter intervals feel kind of like randomly placed uh two I didn't feel like any of these animals had like personality. Like it, the the movie did not dwell upon them for me to like get a sense of their personality. So I never really learned their individual names. And and like three, like the animals didn't seem to like the animal that the chapter title is named after usually doesn't even get that much focus in its chapter. Like it felt really random to me. The whole yeah. Thing. Uh, oh, go for it. I'm thinking, well, now I'm, like, thinking more about it and, like, how they named the alien. Are we, do, like, is this spoiler free? Am I, am I able, well, we've been. Jessica already said that Steven Yoon died, so. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> but them calling the alien jean jacket and, like, Kiki's horse was well. M's horse was supposed to be Jean Jacket. That was supposed to be mine, and they named it Jean Jacket, mm-hmm. and she was the one that got the shot, so it's hers. Like mm-hmm. I think that mm-hmm. like they are. I think that the names were deliberate, and I I kind I kind of like that. Like I was thinking back on the ghost about how like 
his whole thing is as like a not every animal can be trained maybe mm-hmm. you know this right trained, yeah you know like yeah yeah I think that's a good that's a really good point because I like I was confused about the Gordy stuff because I think that 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 is supposed to be like super important and it's supposed to be revealing something about the story to us and it's and it's kind of like uh I'm like I'm not sure is he like are they saying this is spoilers everyone okay spoilers are coming <laughs> okay. you're past that you don't have to say it if you have not I'm seen I'm just no. saying yeah. <laughs> um but like whenever whenever Steven Yun as a child is like looking at the chimp and he goes like he's already killed everyone and bludgeoned them all to death and like he goes to fist bump him because it's what he was trained to do on the show so it's like even though they're animals they're still trained like it's still going against their nature when they have this training in their head and so they're trying to essentially like you can break a horse then you can break this alien as well so it's like trying to be like okay we can we can like the alien is mad at us and so now we're going to try to trick it so that we can break it or whatever but then they end up just killing it i guess and so that's kind of the like disconnect like uh is that what we were is that what we were trying to do so you see what we're saying like oh wait go ahead yeah gordy was an animal that they trained and then i think that mm. steven young's character felt some sort of responsibility for this animal that he had been trained alongside the exact same way that the haywoods mm. feel like this sort of um you know ownership responsibility towards their horses and the animals that they train and then when those animals like go against their training and then rather like go you know instincts only Mm-hmm. Then, and like the the havoc that ensues, the chaos and the death and the carnage, there seems to be this sort of like responsibility, like this is my mm-hmm. fault. And, and then, in those cases, they do have to kill the thing. Like Yeah, and like the, the only thing that can be done to like save everyone from the damage, there is no going back, is just to kill it. So it's like, yeah. we can't train this thing. We can't, you mm-hmm. know contain it it can't be tamed it's like miley cyrus it can't be tamed you got to put it down <laughs> <laughs> i'm curious like what to do with any of that though like it, it is the movie straight up just like about animals and whether or not animals can be tamed that seems like a weird thing for a movie to be about no i think i think the gordy thing is so so steven yun's profiting off of his trauma by kind of regurgitating that in his show and so he had this very traumatic thing happen to him and he's using that to you know make money and the ending of the 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 ending of the movie you see um after kiki palmer's killed the alien um you see all the the press people and the media people like showing up and so and that's why she kind of looks at at them first it makes a face because it's literally almost like repeating the cycle where she's just gone through this very traumatic thing where she thinks that OJ's died um, and is about to like use this trauma that she's going to have to become this whole you know media cycle that she's been kind of craving since the beginning of the movie um, until OJ shows up and that kind of you know breaks it to a degree. I did not. Yeah, that's a good point. I did not think about it that way. But like, I think. Yeah, I mean, it didn't. It didn't change anything for me. It's just <laughs> yeah, I understood like, what was going I, on. We're talking about. I just. Oh, go ahead, I just yeah. think that the the writing just should have been tighter. But it doesn't affect how I think that I enjoyed the movie. Like, I still think that it was cohesive enough and scary enough for me to be engaged with it. And I also enjoyed like the Haywoods together as characters and like. I get, I've seen lots of stuff about, like, the, all of the characters being flat and, like, we don't know anything about them. And my my only character that I have huge complaints about is Steven Yun's character. Because it's like, if we either need to be given, like, more or less of his backstory. Like, when we're given more of it, it's like, 
what caused okay so this child went through this extremely traumatic thing what causes him to become a piece of shit like i don't i don't what caused him to become interested in aliens yeah like Like, how do we get from point a to point b there (laughs) well i think i think he got interested in the aliens because he had been there for probably however long and had probably noticed the alien and so he's like "Ooh, here money and how it was sticking is, straight up. I don't yeah. know if that was just an omen or something miraculous. Like the a movie shadow seems to be... thing that he looks towards is like, this is some beacon. This is my hope. Mm. This is something that I focus mm. on in the middle of a massacre. And it seems to have this sort of like special property that makes it just stand straight up. Well, mm. it's like a bad miracle, which is the yeah. whole, that's like another part of it too. Mm. It's like something that happens that is not, it is un- in, it's impossible that it happened, but it is not good <laughs> that it happened. And I thought that was, like that's a good point. There are lots of like awful things that happen that are unexplainable. That it's like what what is the word for that? I also don't know. <laughs> like I think it's a good. Any, I think it's any tragedy, a catastrophe. There's a couple words. <laughs> I, I I I look at. I thought Ange- uh, Angelica Jane Bastian had a really. Uh, nice review of the film where she and she kind of gets to the heart of how i felt about it um thanks for asking everybody uh where <laughs> you, you really jumped um, in at any where moment. she she says that um you know it's visually spectacular but there's but nope has nothing to speak of and that's kind of my overall feeling is like yeah it the visuals the visuals are strange because, like Andrew, what you were talking about, there it's very it's this vast open space. I've seen some people. I don't know if Jordan Peele necessarily made this claim, but I've seen some people kind of call it like it's Jaws, but the shark is a UFO. Um, and the the thing about that is is that it's it's ironic with a movie about movie making that they wouldn't make a little bit more of a decision to, um, you know hide the the monster a little bit more and kind of like really lean on cinematic tricks to kind of to you know to really emphasize the the horror and the in the in the spectacle of it you know it becomes which i mean it has to be it's literally a flying it's a it's a ufo and so it becomes kind of a cgi show up there um but it's just kind of i think it's just there's a lot of there's a lot of roads going on here a lot of paths that i just don't think he finishes and like and i I kind of felt the same way with us i feel like really i kind of feel like jordan peele should find like either a writing partner or somebody else because i think he's very obsessed with like creating all these 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 pathways for different people that are all supposed to be like speaking to something and connecting with something and things like that but then they don't connect to being a cohesive piece like that's what get out was great because it was very tight it was very contained you there there wasn't any real room to like branch out too much i mean it has wild moments but it's contained within that world and this one i think he's so i think the big issue which is ironic because get out so tight is he's so obsessed with everything outside the camera that you know what's in the camera becomes uh jarbled because he's just he's kind of trying to make i've seen all the different points he's trying to make and the symbolism and like that's great but if you can't bring that all together into one thing and tie it with a bow then what's the fucking point um and like so like the ending scenes like that's that's fun like while they're chasing the 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 ufo around like it's exciting like kiki palmer's great daniel kalu is great but it just it kind of felt like it was a lot of stuff thrown at you and then it ends and i'm like well what the what the hell did any of it like what was what was the point of any of that i mean they survived like that's and that isn't that enough they survived like that's i don't know i I thought that the ending was so good but i but i don't i'm not made to care about them all that much though like i just don't i don't see the interest in these characters like what where is it (laughs) yeah their family's history going all the way back to like being the first like exploited image and then they're the one Mm -hmm. taking the like now the what would then what would now be the the most exploited image of picture of a alien well i mean i think that is really cool conceptually right but like what name a uh name a personality trait that 
Daniel Kaluuya's character has. Stoic. Grumpy. Yeah, like that's they're just doing like the blank affect thing. Um no, he's not given. He's he. Nobody's really given much to work with, to be honest. Like it's like that's that's what's very frustrating is they're all very good, and they're all. But I mean, like to your like the points we've made. Daniel Kaluuya is not given anything to do. Kiki Palmer's not really given much to do. Stephen Yun's not given much to do. You know, it's just like and so they're like they're all they're all doing like a great job, but it's 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 I think it's away from the text. It's kind of just like Kiki Palmer's just having a ball, you know. Daniel Kaluuya is just kind of brooding around, you know. It's like it's great. It's but then so, connect, it's done doing yeah, anything. I disagree. It's so nice whenever you have like a horror movie protagonist that is like, nope, absolutely not. Like instead of instead of them like trying to be the hero, they're like, I'm I love that he just like falls asleep in the truck because he's like, I'm not going to try to get out like of this vehicle while this thing is like flying around. Um, well, I feel like he is also that he also acts that character in Get Out, but the character in Get Out has so much more personality to him. Like, yeah, I, think, I feel like I know that guy, you know, I, and I think that one of the things that I one of the things that I thought about that I was confused about the choice is that. Like, Jordan Peele likes to do this thing in his movies where the, like, main protagonist, like, we're given a flashback of them having, like, a traumatic moment in their childhood. And when we, when it's revealed in the movie, we get some sort of insight to the connection in the plot that is going on and how it impacts them. But that flashback is given to Steven Yun's character, and I don't understand, like, that, I don't understand why that was the case. Like, if if it was given to Daniel Kluwer's character, then maybe you would feel more connected to him, and you wouldn't have this, like, well, I don't really care if they survive or not. Well, Daniel Kaluuya's character is given, like, he's established as a guy who's grieving because in his first scene, his dad dies. And, like, that is sort of the the dominant, like, part of his character for the rest of the movies. Like, in both cases, in Steven Yeun and Daniel Kaluuya, it almost feels like we're using trauma as, like, a shorthand to a character or a personality, but are not actually seeing the character who was traumatized, Right. Yeah, it's kind of I, nice not seeing like some tragic backstory. Like to like be very frank, like it's nice when black people in film don't have added trauma, like where we don't have to like dig and make it sad. I saw somebody who was writing a view about a review or a critique or whatever about how like Nope is just as like also about like black joy and how like that's like worth like looking at and that's like uh worth talking about and so that's a really good point about like the trauma like gives you further insight into them but like making the traumatizing experience like the death of this figure that he has just like modeled himself after like his identity like goes away so then it's like well who is he going to be following this like how is he going to step up he's got a legacy to fill a really big Stetson his dad left behind like mm-hmm. does it fit no he wears a Carhartt trucker hat like you know what what can what can he do to like make this identity for himself and what but but I look at him as a loving older brother that like has a great relationship with his younger sister and has always seen her like I liked their little sign off to each other. Like that really, like that got me. I got a little yeah. sad watching him and like her do that. I was like, mm-hmm. no, he's gonna die. Like, and then he lives on a horse called Lucky. Like, how great is that? It- Lucky is the only horse that survives. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I like I like that interpretation of his character. If only, I mean, gosh, I wish they would have written that into the actual character. That would have been great. Great. I'll follow, I'll follow Jordan. I follow him on Twitter. It's fine. Yeah, like like that sounds awesome. If only they could have imbued that into the actual text. That would have been nice. I'll give them my notes sometime. Um, any anything else on note before we 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 wrap it up or? It's a good movie. We have the final word. Yes. <laughs> Here's a non-nope. Oh, go ahead, Jessica. Yeah, I mean, 
And like, I, I know that Zach hates when I do this, where it's like, shouldn't we be thankful that we got a movie like this? And I am actually thankful. Because <laughs> yeah. like, there's so much shit that's coming out now. And like, is giving Jordan Peele money to make a blockbuster really the worst thing? Ever? No, I don't think so. No, but it, I mean, he made a bunch of money on this, so it's not like he's gonna lose his his thing. Like, I mean, I do, <laughs> I do want to piggyback off of just no, we gotta go. Thing. Sorry, like, I am really <laughs> thankful for Jordan Peele as like a household name auteur. Like his movies get marketed as a Jordan Peele film, not like the new Blumhouse movie or whatever. Like people, it, he is sort of like inspiring a certain like level of casual moviegoer to think about filmmaking from like an authorial level and I think about like filmmaking choices and stuff like that that's really cool it's really really cool and I'm so glad that we have like original standalone blockbusters that have are given giving so much creative control to a filmmaker like Jordan Peele right and um I definitely want to see what he where he goes from here because I think he's a talented dude uh, the the movie this year that he's involved with that I'm more excited for than Nope, though, is uh, Wendell and Wild. Have the Henry Selleck movie. movie. Um, it's it's a stop motion animated film starring Key and Peel, directed by Henry Selleck, creator of Coraline, <laughs> and it's about two demons trying to escape from hell. I I want to see this movie. It's got to be great. Um, no, I mean right. I I agree, but at the same time, like we. Can- it's not that one of one is not exclu- exclusive to the other. It's great that Jordan Peele is making these movies, and it's great that people are showing up for original entertainment. You can still criticize it. You can still criticize it. Yeah, yeah. Original entertainment is not necessarily good. Here he goes. That can't just be. No, I'm not going to virtue. I'm not going to virtue. Say, if anything, we're not doing him any good if we're just like hailing him as this like genius. Like, Here he come goes. on. Like, you got you can still criticize him. Jesus. It's possible that, like, getting hailed as a genius with his first movie has kind of fucked him up. Yeah, if anything. But, I mean, he came out fucking guns blazing. I mean, oh it's so God. good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Christ almighty. Like, he, I, I mean, he, he did it already. He's shocking. Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. You know, so did Orson Welles. Orson Welles made some good movies after that. Who? Orson Welles. <laughs> Never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! All right, well, we're gonna go talk about another auteur in part two as we uh, karate chop some some dudes with faster pussycat kill kill after this. If you want wild living fast, and if you want to end up giving your all, let me call pussycat is living reckless. Pussycat is right high. And we're back with episode 414 of Cinematary. In this part, we're going to be continuing our Young Critics Watch Old Movie series with 1965's Faster Pussycat, Kill Kill. Directed by Russ Meyer from a script by Meyer and Jack Morin. The film stars Tura Satana, Haji, uh, Lori Williams, Susan Bernard, and Stuart Lancaster. Uh, the film follows sadistic go-go dancers Varla, Rosie, and Billy as they break free from the nightclub where they perform and race out to the desert to stir up a little mayhem. After karate expert Varla kills an innocent man, the voluptuous trio takes his girlfriend hostage as they attempt to wheedle a hidden fortune from a misogynistic old man and his muscle-bound, brain-damaged son. Uh, the film was a follow-up to an er- to an earlier Meyer movie. Meyer said, quote, We had just done a film called Motor Psycho, which was about three bad boys and had gone through the roof. So I said, well, let's do one with three bad girls. Uh, the screenplay is credited to Moran f- uh, from a original script story by Russ Meyer. The first draft of the movie was titled The Leather Girls and was written over a brief four period or four day period by Moran, who was who also collaborated on Common Law Cabin and Good Morning and dot 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 goodbye. Uh, with Meyer. The screenplay went through a second working title, The Man Killers, and had already begun production when the sound editor, Richard S. Brum- uh, Broomer, uh, came up with the now immortal final title. 
although neither Moran nor Meyer overtly cited any previous or prior works as inspiration, the plot has been called a quote loose remake of Desperate of the Desperate Hours or possibly The Virgin Spring by one film critic, and quote a pop art settling of amenities by a classical staller. So, very classical, you know, mythology in this. Uh, Lori Williams, I'm being cast in the movie, uh, quote, Russ didn't want to hire me because he didn't think I had a big enough bust. I said I could use push-ups into my bra, which I did. He didn't know whether it would work, but then in rehearsals he finally said, okay. I kind of did my part like a cartoon, like the rest of the film, bigger than life. Russ Meyer on working with Tura Satana, uh, quote, she had a substantial bosom and wasp waist. Uh, she had the capability of dealing with the martial arts segments. She was recommended to me by Haji. She made it clear during the shooting that she didn't like any, any or didn't like my discouragement of canubial, canubial bliss on my time. I didn't I didn't want something to occur that might make one of the participants quit and end up on a bus, leaving me up the river. She told me she couldn't work under these circum, those circumstances. That for that length of time she couldn't work without men. She knew I didn't like that. She said that she couldn't function without sex i said okay you not me i asked her if she, there was anyone on the crew that she wanted she looked over to the assistant cameraman and i walked over and asked if uh he would like to go to bed with her my only request is that she only do it once a night i wanted her to be fresh she said okay uh years later i asked him years later i asked him if it was uh once a night and he smiled and said no it was every it was every hour Tura was very much in charge of, uh, during Pussycat. Women have found the movie to be fun and attractive. Most of my films are directed to the one-armed viewer. She is a very strong woman, and because of that, the film has found a lot of female fans. I think women today feel a lot better of her taking charge and maintaining control of the situation. Women have come up to me in England and New York and have said, quote, it's about time someone did this. Well, it was made over 20 years ago. Um, Meyer on the appeal of the movie, quote, Pussycat has lived and lived, and I've been, uh, I've been with it all over in Russia, Germany, almost every country, really. Uh, filmmaker John Waters said that, th- that this movie is his favorite film of all time, saying, quote, beyond a doubt, the best movie ever made. It is possibly better than any film that will be made in the future. <laughs> uh, in 2021, the the Walking Dead star Norman Reedus announced that his production company would be making a television series version of the movie. Quote, I've been watching Russ Meyer's film since I was a kid, wearing my faster pussycat kill kill shirt to school. It's safe to say I'm beyond inspired by Russ's fil- style of filmmaking, and I'm over the moon excited for the opportunity to reimagine this story for the modern world. Do we have to do that, though? Yes. Does that need to idea? reimagine? It's, that's that's the world we live in, y'all. Right there. Um, Variety 1965 Faster Pussycat Kill Kill is a somewhat sordid, quite sexy, and very violent murder and kidnap theft meller, which includes elements of rape, lesbianism, and sadism. sadism. I want to mention that there's lesbianism. Wait, where is the lesbianism? I don't remember. Are you lesbianism. kidding me? Rosie was a lesbian. She was in love with Varla the whole time. Uh Clothed in faddish uh, leather and boots and equipped sorry, with sports cars. Some direction. some good performances emerge from a one-note script via very good Russ Meyer direction and his outstanding editing. And in 1995, Roger Ebert said, take away all the jokes, the elaborate camera angles, the violence, the action, and the sex, and what remains is the quintessential Russ Meyer t- image. A towering woman with enormous breasts who dominates all the men around her. Demands sexual satisfaction and cast off men in the same way that in mainstream sexual fantasies, men cast aside <laughs> women. Meyer's extraordinary women are, of course, fascinating to those who, uh, to those with breast fetishes. But look, <laughs> take a, but look a little longer, and you will notice that the breasts are not o- always presented as centers of desire. Instead, they're weapons used to intimidate men. Uh, on that note, let's talk a little bit about Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. Um, Grace, I'm going to start with you because I believe out of the four of us, you're the only one who has seen this. Because yeah, Jessica, you and Andrew had not seen this before, correct? Correct. Mm-mm. Yeah. So, Grace, you're the you're the you're the pussy cat expert. Yes, I'm the pussy cat. I and I've always been. Um, the two a.m. It's it's a way of life, and <laughs> the way that this movie found me and has held me close to its ample, substantial bosom has been the most meaningful relationship of my life. I live for this movie. I live for Russ Meyer. I love his philosophy. I love the way these women look. I aspire and admire 
every single frame. I worship at the altar of hot <laughs> electric sex. This is incredible. <laughs> this movie hot is everything. Sex. So I will not hear a single word about how it exploits women, how it's mm. the male gaze. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. It's not true. <laughs> Think critically <laughs> for a second. <laughs> This is it. This is everything I look for in a movie. It's violence. Every line is a line. I mean, and also like, (laughs) no, you're right. Every line is a line. Every Every line line is a line. line. That's my favorite thing about it. Yeah, it's true. Yes, of course. And as a proud Italian American woman, woman, I am like very happy to like see myself, see myself so, 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 so well represented. Um, I don't think that what Haji does is like a caricature or like a parody. I think it's like very critical and 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 uh, very well thought out portrayal of this this a rosy character. You know, I she's couldn't tell sp- she was supposed to be Italian. I was she's trying Italian. To out she says, why, "I'm gonna spin a dry you." That means time. I'm gonna spin dry you. Thank you for that translation. <laughs> Man, I'm I'm glad that you were not offended by that because that accent was like, I mean, because Haji is played by an Asian woman, so it's like, uh, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I guess that's why I was confused. Like there felt like a mismatch. No, between, I mean she yeah. like yeah. studied. I read that she like took acting. Class. You know, she didn't. <laughs> you know, I read it on IMDb. Page, so. I wrote it on her. I wrote it on her IMDb page. She studied under Maslow. Like she, you know, or not Maslow. What is it? M- Maslow hierarchy. Maslow. Of what is what's the one? What is it made of? Maslow's hierarchy. Maslow hierarchy of needs. No, not right, so, that one. It's. You had other hierarchy. Maslowski. Oh, okay. That she How studied that. That's Grace. <laughs> question. So yes. going back to the thing you said about like I will not. You know, I do not give a shit about the arguments about the male gaze in this movie, um, or exploitation or whatever. Um, exactly. Now, I am not going to, I am not going to make that argument because I agree with you. But like, what would you <laughs> say to that argument? Like, what's the, um, what's the I would say that, that um, y- yes, these women are beautiful. They are stunning. Like, there's no question about that. And I think that the way that the camera looks at these women is exactly how Russ looks at these women is exactly how Russ Meyer looks at them in this sort of like, that is like, that is beautiful. Like that is worshipful there. Yes. There's definitely this, uh, she is a God. There's this like goddess Mm -hmm. worship aspect to it, which I really like. Um, I would also say that like, Yes, these women are beautiful. Yes, their looks, you know, are, um, they use them to their advantage. You know, um, yes, you're looking at me, but it's like, you're looking exactly where I want you to look. Mm -hmm. I still control that. Um, Then there's also this sort of, um, they have real agency. I mean, they they suffer the consequences of these awful, awful actions. Like they do terrible, awful things and no one comes in to save them. They're beautiful damsels in distress. No one swings in to rescue them. No, suffer. You did these things, you murdered, you killed, you yeah. all in all because you were, uh, what was it? You got a, you got the hots for the long green, like, cause mm-hmm. you want money and you're gonna suffer for that. Like your greed is your own downfall. And I, I didn't really, expect I really the like movie to kill them off. I thought that was kind of shocking. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, what are they going to do? Are they going to ride off into the sunset? I mean, yeah. it's still like a story where like bad things happen to bad people. Like mm-hmm. they're fun to watch. And I'm definitely rooting for her. I'm like, yeah, knock his lights out. You know, yell at him, karate chop him, stab his ass. Like. Yeah. And like all those, uh, that whole family they run into is like just chock full of like weird bad people too. I mean, I guess it's mostly the dad who's the bad guy and like the the one son is, is like he can't really help what's going on and then and the other is like maybe a bit more morally conflicted or something. But like the the situation of this movie of like this group of people meeting this group of people, it feels like... Um, 
It's funny, I'm, I'm wearing a Texas Chainsaw Massacre shirt right now. It's like if the family from Texas Chainsaw Massacre just like met another family from Texas Chainsaw Massacre and just like ruined each other's lives. Maybe that's the show uh, that, that Norman Reedus like is going to make. It's going to be like a sitcom um, and it's going to be just two terrible people, you know. Oh, God. <laughs> but yeah. Um, Jessica, what did you make of the movie? So I'm not a real, I'm not really like an exploitation film kind of gal. I less so than Grace. I'm kind of like, uh, watching, I, think every, I don't think anybody's on Grace's watching, level. Watching like lots of like <laughs> violence and sex is not my fave thing in the world and not how I am like, yeah, this is a great way that I want to spend my time. However, I do think that when, like, I think with this film specifically, like, I agree with Grace on how how empowering it is for women, and, like, specifically women of color, because, like, two-thirds of the leads are women of color. And so that, to me, was, like, blew me away. Like, I was like, this is an older movie, and there are women of color who are in a gang who are, like, kicking people's asses. Like, that's kind of insane, to be honest. And I was, like, very captivated by Varla, and, like, her, her character is just, like, just power just power in a person like it is like she's given so so much power and so much control and it is like in all of the ways that she is shot and in all of the ways that people look at her like it is like she is like demanding the attention of everyone and yeah <laughs> exactly and like I I read that Tura like improvised a lot of her lines. Like she played a huge part in writing the lines for her character. She became the character and um they gave her an opportunity to do that, which is also kind of insane for the time of the the women in the movie had a lot to do with the way that the movie was made and they were given room to creatively partake in the process of making it. And it was so interesting to me that I was like, I literally could just watch a movie about how this movie was made. That's how much I like how interesting all of that was, because it like seems like something that didn't really happen at the time. And, like, uh, like Varla's character is very strong and empowered, but it's also very cool to learn that, like, Tura, like, had a martial arts background, and they let her, like, do her own stunts and, like, be a part of it in that way, too, which is also just so badass. Like, that part of it was very cool, too. Um, yeah, I think... I was looking a little bit on, or I think I came across it in like a letterbox review, but Tura, um, this was kind of like, she did, she did mainly like exploitation films similar to this. And this was kind of like her thing, like beating up a bunch of people, predominantly men was, was kind of like the thing that she, that, that was her, that was her whole, uh, that was her whole brand. Yeah. That was her whole brand going on. Um, and yeah, it's it's very uh it's very interesting to kind of see, um, to see uh, like there's such a uh, a a uh, stark difference between all three of the characters. You know, they all very much have like very vivid, th- vivid person like vivid but different personalities all like kind of going for the most part to the same goal like grace you mentioned haji's character uh very it's, it's kind of doing a completely different thing than like the laurie williams character who's doing a completely different thing than tura and it's kind of fun it, i think it's like a perfect like marriage of the three characters all kind of coming together because you have all that and it creates all of this kind of like I say chaos not in like a bad way but like this great chaos between like what you're describing Andrew where you have these people that they're coming in contact with and them because just the chaos of all those personalities compared with that it's just like that's where a lot of the fun comes from and I I had the one the one review talking about it's a one note script but a lot of the a lot of what's great about it kind of is less about what's actually on the page and more about just how these characters are engaging with one another um, you think of like, well, I think somebody mentioned that Tura's every line that she says in this movie is a sexual innu- innuendo. She never says like a normal, like a normal phrase. Everything is a sexual innu- innu- innuendo. And it's less like how clever it is on the page. And it's more just the way she says it is great. 
Well, no. It, well, just the audacity. Well, she just like just, says it with like the, fucking the swagger to too. It. Like, <laughs> like, you know, like you think about the whole scene when she's seducing yeah, yeah. the one bro- the the one brother there, um, and like it's funny how he like completely switches like twenty minutes later, but like in that moment he's just like, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm, I'm powerless. I'm sorry. I'm in love with you. She casts a spell, and like there's such like i said this to you earlier when we were talking about beyond the valley of the dolls how there's like some there's a there's some po- there's a poetic nature to these lines a lyrical nature mm-hmm. it's musical it's like scatting it's improv it's so clever um when they're doing the timing trials and the uh tommy and the girl they drive up He's like, you guys doing some timing trial, t- timing trials, you know, how fast were you going? She's like, we know how fast we were going. You could time that thing with an hourglass. Like, was someone talking yeah. about my figure? Like, it's so, yeah. like, they're listening. Like, it, it is so much less about, like, what's less on the, it's it's less about, like, the dialogue that's written, but it's how these actors are There's listening There's a musicality to, to it. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, Grace, like, I know you're also a big fan of Elvira. And I, I feel the same way about the script for Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, right? Like, it, these are, this is a very specific type of writing and type of dialogue that I feel like is almost like a lost art or something. Like, um, is, is there, are there like a large stable of movies for you that like have that kind of writing to them? Like, is there a way that you would describe it? Um, I mean, it's, 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 I don't know. I think it kind of goes back. Like it feels very staged. It feels like theater. It feels like vaudeville almost mm-hmm. like yeah. joke after joke, after joke, after joke, line after line. You're just facing the audience and you're just spitting them out rapid fire. And they just keep laughing. You keep them coming back. I mean, I could this beyond the Valley of the dolls of Iron mistress of the dark Heather's jawbreakers, mm. uh, mean girls. Like the, you know, there are those movies where like every line, Romeo and Michelle's high school reunion, like I almost said high school musical. <laughs> Romeo and Michelle's high school musical. <laughs> That'd be great, but it's like yeah, there there's definitely there's definitely this style, and it's definitely one that how many times can I say definitely, definitely, definitely not Rain Man, <laughs> definitely not Rain Man, but there's uh, there's a style that I lean towards and that I like to pick up on, and uh, it, it it when it hits it's firing on all cylinders and Mm -hmm. it just makes it, it just uh, electrifies me. Yeah. There's definitely something um, with exploitation movies that it kind of is speaking (laughs) a different language than other, you know, than most movies. Like you can't really go in and assess this movie like you would something you know, like the elevator to the gallows that we talked about last week. Those are like working on completely different frequencies and, and ex- exploitation, especially it's to a degree like looking at a genre movie. Um, but I also think that it's, it even has more of a different lens that you have to look at because um, not like nothing being said is like remotely serious. You know, it's, yeah. it's all, it's, you know, it, it, it is literally kind of speaking its own language here. Um, and like, and there's something about it's, I, I, I equate it to almost like watching like a Shakespeare adaptation or like a Jane Austen adaptation where, yeah. where it's Probably about a the different register. It's yeah. yeah. It's just, it's, it's, the, it's all about the language and it either works for you or it doesn't work for you. And I think we can also, we can get into like the kind of violence element of like how exploitation yeah. movies really work. But I think just uh, as you're talking about grace, the language aspect of it, it's, it's something that you either get on board with or you don't. And I think in the, the difficulty, I think a lot of people have when they, when they watch these type of movies is they kind of look at it like they would any other movie. And you're like, no, this movie is absurd. Like, it's like, well, it's immediately um, absurd. We've covered other exploitation movies on the show, right? We did um, Pam Greer's uh, black mama, white mama. Yeah. Uh, we did the velvet vampire uh, with Stephanie Rothman and some others that I'm having a hard time thinking of right now. But I feel like the, just the density with which this movie is written feels uncharacteristic of the genre right i don't i think that a lot of times the the writing in these movies is a little lackadaisical because that's not what people are there for right um so that's one reason why i find it so much impressive here yeah Yeah, your pizza's here ma'am oh no i can't pay you (laughs) 
Yeah, it's like they really did not need to go as hard as they did. <laughs> well, then after a while, it just becomes like impressive how much they just keep it going. Yeah, like the, like the fact that you get to the climax of the movie and and she's still spitting out sexual innuendos is incredible. Yeah, like at like with her dying breath, and she might as well have said a sexual innuendo. It'd been great. Um, uh, let's let's just also talk real quick about like the violence element. Uh, Jessica, mm-hmm. you mentioned before that like oh, that's always the violence and kind of the the how how um, female or other characters are portrayed in these movies is is kind of a is kind of a touch point when it comes to exploitation movies. Um, that's what kind of made our, I think our discussion around like Pam Greer interesting just because she definitely was um, kind of a, a, somebody in her own realm when it came to that. And it's similar. It's kind of the same here. When you look at like, when y'all look at the violence in this movie, it's less, it doesn't have the, um, it doesn't, ha- it's not as like vivid violence as like mm-hmm. some of the Pam Greer stuff where she's using guns and there's like mm-hmm. blood spattering all over the place. And it's much more like, <laughs> on like on the Tarantino spectrum of things. This one is, is, a, is almost a funny one because there's violence, but it's not, it's not as grotesque. It's they're karate chopping people for the most part. <laughs> there's a knife. Yeah. Oh, they use a knife. a knife, a car. The car one is like super funny. Really? Like Cause they're one. just yeah. like mowing people down, like just driving over them. And I love whenever she is like trying to kill the dude with the car and he's like using his muscles to just like try to push it away and it's such a it's such a cool scene well it's like Um, you're also cutting back and forth between these like really close-up shots that make it seem like they're having sex (laughs) while she's doing it it's the ramming this car like (laughs) penetrating well there's the 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 one that was great was when um they're they're walking by the train and the train just goes And then it cuts over to them like close to each other. And then it goes, it's great. It's stupid. I loved it. <laughs> I, I, I like the violence. I, I think back to that opening monologue where it's, you know, violence contained and like, and then it gets like really like, I kind of want to like plug my ears. Like the dialogue gets a little skin crawly where he's like contained in like the supple flesh of woman. It's like, yeah. okay, great. Like I'm very <laughs> uncomfortable in my own body that contains all this violence, but it's like soft, easy, smooth, like violence with a curve to it, like curves in all the right places, you know, like it's suggestive, I mean, uh, suggested violence. I, I don't necessarily want to co-sign this philosophy, but like the way that I understand it, going back to what you were saying, Grace, earlier about like the movie kind of like looking up at the power of women or the beauty of women and kind of like worshiping in awe of them. It, like I I think what the narration is kind of implying is that like women are so powerful in this way if they were also like cruel and violent, they would be like this unstoppable force, something like that, right? Um, I don't know. That's that's a thought. That's a world I want to live in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm I mean, un- campaigning for uh, what a brand. I yeah. am a brand ambassador. <laughs> unstoppable, but like Grace yeah. said before too, like there is punishment for them they do as die. well. Like yeah, they right. die, and the only woman who does survive is the innocent one. Like it is the one mm. who didn't partake in all of the other stuff right actually both i mean both of them are sort of seen as the innocent ones there is kind of a survive there's a morality tale element to this which is weird and 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 you and i I have talked about beyond the valley of dolls i struggle with that movie because of how fun i found it when it was like up and then it eventually is like, but all that stuff is actually like bad and depraved though. Like it, and I, I'm sure it's done somewhat tongue in cheek, right? But it just feels like this weird disconnect that I don't need. And in Beyond the Valley of Dolls, anyways. Well, it's it's such a you know thinking, kind of bringing in like more modern discussions. You know, you see people get going on like and it's been since he started his career, get going on like Tarantino because they feel like his movies are like, it's like, um, like it's promoting the violence. Like, like, Mm -hmm. Oh, like you're going to watch Pulp Fiction be like, I want to do that. (laughs) Um, And it's, and so like, it's almost, it's, it's kind of a weird dissonance between this, which is like, 
I think we can all agree that the three women at the center of the movie is who everybody wants to be. Like they're the coolest characters in the movie. Um, but yeah, I don't like, like, can you end with just them kind of like walking away from it? I guess so. But I guess, you know, in 1965, you kind of have to be like, yeah, they're super cool. But <laughs> um, do you think it's like a us covering our asses kind of thing on the, on the it part could of be Russ because Meyer I think I, I think the thing with Russ Meyer is he's like I'm gonna push the limits as much as I can and then like kind of bring it down so that I don't get like yelled at <laughs> yeah it's like definitely like these guys are gonna die like who cares it's a wild ride sit back relax you know I don't have much beyond that. Do you, do you know much about Russ Meyer outside of like those two movies? I, I I've only seen him personally. Um, he has appeared to me in a vision. Mm. Um, <laughs> what do you say there? He said, <laughs> <laughs> "Well, I can't really repeat it." You know? Oh, sorry. No, it's, that's, oh, yeah. I don't know what I'm the sure. rating is on here. Um, but uh, we don't have a rating, but that's fine. Um, but what I what I what I do know about him, um, I think he like put he put his wife in Valley of the Dolls, and mm-hmm. so you know it's nice to see a legacy of Hollywood wife guys, a la Rob Zombie. Like that's mm-hmm. really fun. Um, I just think he was a guy that just really like loved movies. I, I, you know, I think I've seen he I've fits. seen bits and pieces of Super Vixens. He's also a guy that like really loves to like support like sex workers like a lot of Mm. these women in his movies were go-go dancers porn Mm. stars um sort of these women on the fringes of um entertainment like uh john waters tend Mm. to pull from Mm -hmm. um so i i see that in him and i know that about him um i just really uh respect anyone that is uh, so bold as to like really put themselves on display. Like, this is me. This is what I like. This is what I like to look at. And I know we all yeah. like to look at this and this is great. It's kind this of sex what, positive. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. Like there's definitely like that sort of, I look at it that way. I don't think that there needs to be a re- reboot. And I don't think that our more modern audience could handle it because everyone is so like, I don't care about like sex in a movie. If it doesn't advance the plot. Yeah. Well, sometimes yeah. sex is just sex. Like, and that's what he gives us more often than not, you know, or mm-hmm. do people look different to you when they're horizontal to mm-hmm. quote, <laughs> there, there's there's so much to this that and to russ and to his legacy that like really speaks to me as sort of i guess like a repressed woman that's like opening herself up and then uh empowering a lot catholic mm-hmm. a lot, lot yeah. got my rosary on <laughs> so you know also, like i also just wonder like the reason why they have these like exploitation movies is because it's like stuff that they didn't have in movies before. Like they weren't allowed to have violence in movies right. and they weren't allowed to have sex. And like, we live in a world where you can get those things literally at the click of a button. So like mm-hmm. what, really nice. it just doesn't seem like it may, it would make the same sort of impact. So like, why, like why is my, and I think a lot of people don't see the appeal of that. Like I, I have a hard time putting myself his like, in the period of history where I've just experienced the end of the Hays Code. And then all of a sudden in America, there's just like porn theaters in every city, Mm. right? Mm. Like that would probably be a thing that people like wanted to do because they like didn't have access to erotic images in the way that people do today. Right. Like that would be a huge, I don't know, like new sensation, I guess. That's interesting because then, like, all the morality stuff, like, could that just be, like, that holdover of, like, it's okay, it's okay, here's the haze code, calm down. Yeah, it's okay, like they're you know? putting their own haze code on it. Yeah. Well, like, it's and it's kind of differentiating, like, he's, Russ Meyer's kind of going, like, so it's a little bit of porn, but it's also cinema. <laughs> yeah, I think he said he was, like, he got, like, a NC-17 rating for Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. And he's like, if I knew, if I had known I would have gotten that, I would have put way more sex and violence in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, he's also interesting because he he um, he brought up a lot of filmmakers. Um, people like Martin Scorsese, like, worked under him. Um, and so he, and because there was such a low, you know, it's not like, 
like today you have somebody who makes like an indie movie or maybe directs some like television or something like that and then goes on to like you know make a marvel movie or some or some sort of bigger movie um like you're kind of getting thrown into the wolves there to a degree because you're going from something a little bit smaller budget into a giant movie um and russ meyer like because these b movies that he were making were kind of low low fruit it wasn't like anybody was expecting a lot out of them yeah i know um that was two you had mm -hmm. uh (laughs) was expecting much out of them uh it allowed a lot of filmmakers to also kind of learn not learn learn the craft but learn how things fucking operate you know like Mm -hmm. learn how to like run a set and do all that kind of stuff and so it was like also he also had this like cool pipeline of filmmakers learning how to how to how to just make a movie happen um so that then as they moved on to to larger careers they had those like basic skills down because they learned it while working on these b pictures and moved on to like you know big movies that's uh, something I wish we had. I wish we had. I wish we had something like that today, where like you know, a you mentioned program. you mentioned you mentioned yeah. the Gray Man. I wish the Russo brothers would have actually like learned how to make a movie before they started making movies. I wish they had seen a movie before they. <laughs> I wish they had seen a movie. <laughs> that would have been nice too. That would have been. I mean, like wishful thinking, right? Yeah. So, um, something to mention as well. Yeah. Um, any yeah. any last thoughts or any last fetishes that you would like to get off your plate from? <laughs> Faster who's everyone? Kill, kill. I mean, is this an too easy of a question if I ask who's everyone's favorite pussycat of our in this movie? Josie yeah, asked too. It is too nice. Easy. No, it's, yeah, it's Varla, gotta be. like yeah. Varla's, Varla. like her her bosom could be the second character in the movie. Did you guys yeah. notice how anytime she was in, fr- like, she was never like fully like no. I don't know. She took up so much of the frame. It's like you said, like very commanding presence. Like I really enjoyed that. And as someone who regularly communicates through yelling, I also really loved her delivery. Yeah. So yeah, definitely mm-hmm. Varla's a standout for me. But I fell in love with Rosie, and then Billy for me was just <sighs> Billy was just she. She was fun. She was light. She was pretty. She was blonde. She She's everything I love and hate about blondes. And I'll go on the record sit for that. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to make controversial <laughs> statements here. We, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone down the line wants to just make a biopic about Tora. Mm-hmm. Um, if, you, if you just look at, just like look her up and just look up her life story, it's insane. And also speaks to, like, she's obviously a survivor. Like, uh, one of the, I saw a letterbox review that was like, when you find out that uh, Tura was like gang raped when she was nine years old, and then she tracked down all five of the men and exacted her revenge, and then see her in this as Varla, it is kind of like, damn, like, she does really like mm-hmm. embody that character. And she had to, so like after that happened, she learned martial arts and tried to become uh, like able to, able to do like self-defense and that sort of thing. And then whenever she was, I think like 15, her parents tried to marry her off to a man and they married her off to a guy when she was 15 and she ran away from him after nine months and then fled to California and she uh, got a fake ID so that they thought that she was 18 so that she could be an exotic dancer. And that's how she made her money. But, like, the fact that she survived and then went on to become, like, a movie star, like, that's that's insane. And also the fact that, like, Russ Meyer is, like, like Grace said before, like, giving a chance to these sex workers and, like, showing the creative ways that they contribute to his film like that itself is amazing like it is super cool to see i will tell you jessica there's a i didn't say what year this came out but there's a documentary called tura it has an exclamation point um by (laughs) cody jarrett that that includes uh john waters and margaret cho that is oh okay there is so there is a documentary about her nice um (gasps) Yeah, because I'm just looking at the movie. It's it's funny, Grace, that you mentioned Rob Zombie because she was in Rob Zombie's The Haunted World of El Super Bisto. Very cool. <laughs> so. I'm sure so. they had a lot to talk about. 
Yeah, tying it all. Tying it's it all Hollywood. Together. It's a movie about movies. Exactly. There's. A, I'm, I'm now. I'm like just looking through her. She was in a Billy Wilder movie. What? Irma. Irma. Uh, Irma Vet. Irma. <laughs> Le if only she is an Irma vet. If the only. new Irma vet. A Pari- the movie is a Parisian po- a policeman gives up everything for the love of a free living sex worker. Hell yeah. Oh, it's it's Shirley MacLaine and Jack Lemmon again. Wow. But I guess she's in with Billy Jack Robert. Lemon in. Yeah. So we're just all we're all connecting the dots here. Cinema. Young critics watch old movies and we're able to make these connections. This is why. Really quick, tell your viewers this is why they should go back. They should watch older movies. You mm-hmm. learn so much more. You you gain a better understanding and appreciation for the films that you can t- that you, for the films that you watch to come. Don't my cats are fighting right now, so I won't mute myself. You'll just have to hear that. That you'll have to hear that faster pussycat kill kill fight in the background. Watch older movies just because it's in black and white. Just because it's in another language. Watch movies if you care at all. Hell Just yeah. watch Co-sign. other ones. Yeah, watch movies. That's watch yeah, movies. we think we think that as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody okay. I'll that was great. My, thank you. I'll get off my that's great. soapbox. Oh, it's, we should have done like you and the big one here. Like we Yeah, done, what the oh, hell? Yeah. Like I don't know. I don't know if I can. And now that I know that you can do that, make mine bigger again. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Hey, pretty girl. There you go, Grace. Take the take the stage there. Um. All right. Well, that'll wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Cinematary on Twitter and Instagram at handle at Cinematary and on Letterbox at letterbox.com slash Cinematary, where we post um, all two movies that we talked about in this episode. Um, If you'd like to support the show, head over to patreon.com slash Cinematary. Whether it's $5, $1, we have a few $10, you know, we're always happy to find support for the show. Um, Thank you to our supporters, uh, Kim, (laughs) Chad Newsom, Corey Willingham, Candace Sisson, Ron Hayes, Teresa Marsathi, uh, Titus Arthur, and Tyler Chandler. We appreciate your patronage. Um, next week we're going to continue our young critics watch old movie series and we're uh we're diving into a little bit of socialism i am cuba in 1964 i'm sure we won't have any politically charged discussions during the movie (laughs) i'm sure it'll just be like this movie you know and then the week after that we'll be getting into some john waters so it'll be a whole who who is on the uh, i am cuba episode that's for that's for i know i'm on it but I don't know. We're gonna have to go find. We're gonna have to go find all the comrades. We're gonna go find the comrades (laughs) and talk. I didn't say that. You said that. I think the CIA is looking at me now. (laughs) No, of course the the FBI is not. Because what does the FBI do anyway? All right, that's the end of the episode. Goodbye forever, everybody. Bye.